and kind of as day follows night, it's inevitable that our interventional colleagues will be looking for ways to complement the traditional surgical interventions for the tricuspid valve. Dr. Wendy Sang is a staff cardiologist and clinician investigator at Toronto General Hospital. She's an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. And as we prepared for this talk, my co-host, Dr. Moreno, described her as a mentor and a valuable colleague for his career. Dr. Sang is the head of the Complex Valve Clinic at Toronto General Hospital. She's been a member of several ASC, EA, CVI guideline writing groups. And she also serves on the editorial board of the uh, Journal of the American Society of Cardiography and is a member of the Royal College Area of Focused Competence Subcommittee for Adult Echocardiography. She currently holds the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada National New Investigator Award. And her research focus is on congenital and valvular heart disease, 3D echocardiography, and artificial intelligence. The title of Dr. Sang's presentation is Percutaneous TV Interventions. Wendy? Thank you. That was a, a nice introduction. I'm, it's a real pleasure to be here and be a part of this program. So I'm going to talk about percutaneous tricuspid valve interventions. Uh, here are my disclosures. So the objectives of my talk are to update the evolving percutaneous options to manage TR. And then I'm going to use a case to review patient selection with a focus on the imaging side of it and pre-assessment for percutaneous tricuspid valve interventions. And then to explain the role of TE during percutaneous tricuspid valve interventions. So as previous speakers have alluded to, tricuspid regurgitation is a very common problem. Um, this is data from Olmsted County showing that tricuspid regurgitation, moderate or greater tricuspid regurgitation in the green line, increases with age. And when you compare the prevalence of tricuspid regurgitation against all left-sided disease, it's about a quarter of that um, in terms of the prevalence. And it's equal to significant aortic stenosis. You've seen data from uh, Annette showing that most tricuspid regurgitation is secondary in nature. And when you look at the mortality data, uh, this is a different study looking at almost 9,000 patients. And you can see that compared to the general US population, the unadjusted mortality for both primary and secondary TR is significantly higher. And when you actually adjust for comorbidities, it doesn't matter whether you have primary or secondary TR, the mortality is much higher. And then you just had heard this beautiful talk about the outcomes with surgery and the mortality rates run between eight to 10%. Um, and this is data from the inpatient service uh, administrative database is showing that even though over the years, tricuspid regurgitation surgeries were both repair and replacement have increased, there's still the stubborn elevation in mortality in the hospital setting. So we need something else more than just surgery to intervene on these patients. And so why haven't we had other techniques before that? Well, there have been challenges. Part of this is due to tricuspid valve anatomy. The tricuspid valve is the largest valve in the body, well, cardiac valve in the body. It's a large size, its shape, its annulus is more is irregular and it's got a 3D shape. Most tricuspid regurgitation has a lack of calcium. It's very hard to um, tether something without something solid there. And the annulus and tissue itself is actually quite fragile. The location of the tricuspid valve also makes it a little bit difficult to deliver devices. There's some angulation in relation to superior and inferior vena cava. And there's structures there we have to be careful about, the AV node, the His bundle, and also the RCA. There's a risk when we put in devices that we could occlude the coronary sinus, the vena cava, or the RV outflow tract. Uh, um, tract. And finally, the RV anatomy is highly variable due to the trabeculations, and this also makes it more challenging when you have to put a catheter in to lead your device in placement, and you have to be very careful. The RV wall, free wall, unlike the, uh, unlike the LV, is quite thin, and we could cause good damage. And finally, many of the patients we see with tricuspid regurgitation have pacemaker leads and ICD leads, which we then have to actually deal with as well. So when we look at percutaneous tricuspid valve procedures, we actually break them down into kind of three uh, approaches. One is sort of um, devices that simulate a valve repair. And then we actually have valve replacement devices. And then we have heterotropic, essentially valve devices that sit outside of the tricuspid valve. Let's go through each of them. So the most common ones you're gonna hear about are the valve repair devices. And the most, most popular right now or, or, or used right now are the tri-leaflet co-optation devices or transcatheter edge-to-edge repair devices for the tricuspid valve. So essentially what you want to do is you're going to bring the two leaflets together and sort of decrease, increase that co-optation surface. 
The other side of this is the tricuspid annular application devices to try and reduce the annular size. And that's what these uh, devices are doing. They either cinch it to or bicuspidize the valve, or they just generally bring in the annulus to try and reduce, improve that coaptation line. Now, one thing I do want to note is that there's no FDA approval for any of these devices for tricuspid regurgitation, although some of them do have C mark as I've marked. Now, this, there are many studies on tricuspid um, edge-to-edge repair to, um, devices, but this is probably the most um, important one to date. This is this Triluminate study, and it took 350 patients, and they randomized them to either receiving the tricuspid valve edge-to-edge device or medical management alone. Now, their outcome was a hierarchical composite outcome, which means they looked at death from any cause or tricuspid valve surgery, hospitalization for heart failure, and improvement in quality of life. And this was assessed using a questionnaire. This was a safety and efficacy trial, and they showed that it was safe. They had about a 7% leaflet detachment rate, but overall 98% of those who underwent the edge to edge repair were free from major adverse events at 30 days. Now, in terms of the efficacy, they met their target for the primary endpoint with the TUR group. Those who received TUR did much better. However, when you looked at the hard outcomes, it, it wasn't driven by need for surgery or death of any cause or hospitalization for heart failure. It was mainly driven by improvements in the quality of life scale. So for many of us, these lack of hard outcome improvements was actually quite disappointing. And there's a question as to why this might have been. The first, which was brought up by Dr. Ladder, is maybe the comorbidities and not the TRs that actually cause mortality in this population. And fixing the TR doesn't make a difference in what happens to these patients. The other question is whether the patient selection was appropriate for these devices. Compared to prior TUR studies, these patients were less ill. They, there was a significant portion who had NYJ to class two symptoms, and they excluded patients with pulmonary hypertension and dialysis who were, make up about 50% of the TR patients we see in our clinics. The other thing is the mean LV ejection fraction was 59% in this trial. This ex means that we excluded a major population who had secondary TR. In the TUR, in the TUR group, 13% had severe or greater residual TR, and whether this played a role is also in question. And similarly, the medical management, less Lasix was used there, and perhaps some of these patients still required Lasix afterwards, and that might account for some of their um, worst outcomes. Finally, whether or not one-year outcomes were too early to demonstrate a benefit. And all of this now was done during the COVID period, and so whether that played a role as well. So the next, so a lot of interest is going to be on the next coming uh, TUR studies because that will really determine the fate of this intervention. In terms of tricuspid annular application devices, um, as you look, the number of published studies are actually quite low. Uh, the number of patients enrolled in these studies are also low, between 15 to 30 patients. Overall, most of the success rates for implantation and procedure success are quite high. However, we have limited information on follow-up and outcomes. Uh, I feel they're quite positive in the small studies that have been reported so far. There's no procedural death or need for cardiac surgery outcomes at, uh, or intervention at this point. Now we've talked about the tricuspid valve repair techniques, but sometimes if there's too much tethering and annular dilatation, there are these devices that have been developed that are spacer devices, or what they do is they try and reduce the effective regurgitation orifice area and improve the co-optation. As you can see here, you put the device in and then you get better co-optation, you decrease the TR. Um, there has been one device that was published on this. However, in the feasibility study, it showed a um, RV perforation and late anchor dislodgement. And so it was pulled from the market for redesign. And so the future is really unclear whether or not it will be coming back out. Uh, for use. So the other big area that people have focused on is on the valve replacement technologies, as shown by Dr. Ladder in his last few slides. Um, these uh, are, are basically a percutaneous way of developing a valve. Um, there are quite a few that are in clinical trials right now. However, overall, uh, the number of patients in these are very small because it's uh, accessed only through clinical trials or through compassionate use. Um, the outcomes that have been reported, once again, we don't have a lot of information, but procedural success ranges from 87 to 100%. However, there's still a significant rate of conversion to open uh, surgery in one study at 6.6%, and 30-day mortality is also not insignificant at 10%. Now, these transcatheter tricuspid valve replacements also have some issues that we have wound um, that need to be addressed. We know from the transcatheter mitral valves that these valves have to be anticoagulated. But in these patients, TR who might have underlying um, overt or latent 
uh, hepatic dysfunction? What is their bleeding risk on anticoagulation? And would this actually mitigate some of the improved outcomes they receive from getting the tricuspid valve? And then the other thing is for these trans, um, cutaneous, per cutaneous valves, what happens if you have a pacemaker lead? So this study is um, taking registry data from the Vivid database and looking at all patients who had transcatheter tricuspid valves. And they broke down these patients into whether those who had pacing systems, no pacing systems, and then if they had a epicardial system or a transvenous system, and then if the transvenous system was entrapped at the time of placement. Overall, if you look at the graphs on the left, they showed that whether or not you had a pacing system or not, there's no difference in death, the need for tricuspid valve intervention or tricuspid valve dysfunction. And there's specifically, if you look, there's no difference between whether or not you had a entrapped RV lead or not. But if you look at what happens after, there were about 10% or three patients had problems with dislodged RV lead after the entrapment or failure in the follow-up period. And then we also haven't dealt with the fact is what happens if these pacer, lead, pacer systems get infected? Um, what happens to that, those patients at that time? And that would have to weigh into the scales of how we manage these patients. Now to move on uh, beyond the actual interventions on the tricuspid valve itself, there are heterotropic devices. They're typically valved devices. They can either sit in both the SVC and IVC at the same time, or they sit in the IVC. Um, some are unique devices and others are devices taken, taken from the TAVI world and then repurposed. The aim of these devices are actually just to mitigate the effect of tricuspid regurgitation on the surrounding organs. And what it does is essentially it sacrifices the right atrium. And so these devices are really directed to end-stage tricuspid valve disease um, or in patients with significant tricuspid annular enlargement um, and tethering of the valves that preclude the use of other devices. Now, how are we deciding how to use this? Now, this is an actually simplified algorithm. There are more complicated algorithms, but I like this because it kind of gives you an idea of where we're heading for in terms of what's the what to do depending on the patient in front of us. So if it's a patient who is um, has primary TR, if it's a restricted pathology or perforation, you are looking at a transcatheter valve replacement. If it's got prolapse or flail, then you're trying to think about maybe heading towards an edge-to-edge -edge repair technique. If you have an implantable device, I think it depends on whether or not you have the ability to remove the device and then what the anatomy looks like underneath there, because it may be a candidate for edge-to-edge -edge repair, or you may be looking at a valve replacement. Now, patients with secondary TR are a little bit more complicated. If it's simply an isolated annulus with no or minimal tethering of the valve, then you're going to be thinking about those annuloplasty devices. If it's got annual dilatation with a little bit of tethering, um, then you can think about using an edge touch repair. However, if you've got significant annular dilatation, tethering, then you're looking at the valve replacements or cable devices or a spacer device. Now, how do we image for these tests? How do we assess patients for them? So on the imaging side, I've made this table here. And what, as you can see, I've broken it down to what the pre-procedure, intra-procedural and post-procedural imaging is, uh, our requirements are, and essentially breaks down to two main imaging modalities for pre-procedural assessment, CT and transesophageal echocardiogram. Um, and intra-procedurally, we're mainly using TE, and in some places they are using a lot of ice, and we'll talk a little bit about why um, towards the end of this talk. And then follow-up is mainly transthoracic with some use of CT if needed. Now, what does CT provide? Well, CT allows us to actually size for valve devices so we can get an annular, uh, tricuspid annular um, size or IVC or SVC size. It also gives us an idea of where the trabeculations are located as well as the RCA and um, better idea of the venous anatomy. So now I'm going to move on to the sort of second half of my talk um, and focused on how we actually assess for the patient. So first step, as, as, as Dr. Ladder, um, um, I guess, uh, discussed in his talk, we really have to assess these patients when they're hemodynamically optimized. If you take them when they're wet, you're going to um, see a lot of TR, but you may also see bigger gaps than you um, that they would be then would be there if they're dry. And so we really want to optimize them. And in some our case, sometimes we have to admit them, get a right heart cath, and then diurese them before we do our assessment. Once they're optimized and they still have severe TR present. Then we will assess for whether or not they've got severe LV dysfunction, RV dysfunction, or significant pulmonary hypertension. Now, depending on your program, some of these may be softer things that you will um, use rather than exclusionary criteria, but it's important to note if your program is a 
whole um, whole pathway heart failure management program, then some of these are not going to be quite the strict criteria or exclusion as you know. And then you go to the tricuspid, um, sorry, assessment by transit esophageal echocardiogram. Now, when I I break, I like to break things down into steps of those. Sometimes we kind of do it all in a um, gestalt manner when we're assessing these patients. But I'm going to go through the a case next, and we'll go through each of these steps. But I think. The main thing first is you have to have good windows and we'll see why when we actually get to the device implantation stage. And then you wanna look at where the jet location and the mechanism is because that will be important in determining how you're gonna intervene on these patients. And then you look for specific things to determine what devices you're gonna be using, coaptation gap, length of leaf, and uh, le length, length, leaflet length and adverse features. So this is a case of an 83-year-old woman who actually had a history of bypass surgery, who had significant tricuspid regurgitation with increased RV size and uh, really didn't want to have surgery again and was referred for TER assessment. So the first step is always the um, good uh, as, um, TE windows. And this is because if you don't have good windows before your procedure. Once you start putting in all of your devices or the, the catheters and so forth to put in the devices, there will be a lot more shadowing and your windows will deteriorate. Without a doubt, good windows become worse during the procedure. So it's important to make sure that your transgastric, your low esophageal and the inflow outflow view, as well as your true four and reverse four chamber views uh, are allow good visibility. And in this case, this woman does have these uh, nice windows here. All right. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk about is these lower deep esophageal views. Many of us are used for the mitral valve to use a mid esophageal view where we have a nice view of the left atrium and then we can see the valves uh, clearly. But we found that because the tricuspid valve is a very anterior structure, you want to slide your probe down to just above the JG junction. So that way you can actually move a little bit more posterior and you can sometimes bring out visualization of the leaflets much earlier. And you'll see in my, um, in my images that we do images both at mid esophageal as well as the deep esophageal, depending on the windows of the patient. And it also slides um, for patients with mechanical mitral valves or aortic valves. Sometimes by doing some of these uh, moving up and down a little bit, you can bring out that tricuspid valve for better visualization. So we have good windows. We're now looking at where the jet, you want to look at both where the jet is located as well as what the mechanism is. So here we're in the transgastric view, looking up at the valve, and you can see that we have a nice central jet here. Ideally for many of the um, edge to edge repair devices, you want to see if there's a jet in the, between the uh, septal and anterior leaflets. And if there's a pacemaker lead, you want to see that there is a jet that is coming on an area separate from where the pacemaker lead, because we try not to jail it if we can. Now, we tend to do um, cut planes through all of our views in order to look at the mechanism of the leaflets. And we try and cut between the anterior and posterior leaflet as well as the septal and um, posterior leaflet and through the main body of the jet. And when you're looking at these, it's not very prescriptive. What you wanna do is you wanna actually put the color on and then put your biplane through because you wanna see what the mechanism or what the underlying anatomy is at the site of the jet, not just looking at the leaflets for the leaflet's sake itself. And here we can see that it's mainly tethering and there's a coaptation defect over here. Now, after we go, we do our transgastric views first in our lab, and then we tend to pull up to do our mid-esophageal views, and that's because the patients tend to be more comfortable at the beginning. Now, for the mid-esophageal views, the most important ones are these reverse four and this inflow-outflow view, and the reason for that is because this is how we know whether or not we're anterior or posterior, and this is where we can see uh, the leaflets in order to know that the clip devices or other devices are in the right place. And when you look at uh, this, you can actually see how this works. So here's your aortic valve. Um, and there's your mitral valve, and here is the anterior leaflet and posterior leaflet and septal leaflet in the background. And you can see how this plays out with the biplane imaging. And so here we are, we've pulled up to the mid esophagus, and we are now going to sweep across the valve from the lateral side to the medial side. Uh, so we both see the anatomy as well as what's happening. And once again, we kind of I have it from left to right, but usually we put the color on first, see where the jet is, and then we want to look at the anatomy underlying it to see what the mechanism is and what the, um, and where uh, where the location is. Once we've done that, then we actually want to look for certain things. We want to look at the gap size here. This is a low esophageal view. You can see the coronary sign is coming in here, and this is an esophageal view. We're looking for gap sizes. In this woman, it was less than seven millimeters. And then we also want to look at the septal leaflet length. We want to make sure it's more than a centimeter and it's not curled or tethered. And you can see that it comes up nicely in this patient here. 
And then we do a reverse for it to look for similar things once again, just to make sure that we have a good view. Finally, we are also looking for adverse features. And adverse features are, as, um, as some patients may have three or four leaflets, they can have deep canons that can, canyons that can make it difficult and our clips will slide through if we try to clip over here. And we, if you see here, we have um, significant uh, cords going to, uh, to the wall here. And if we actually try and clip there, we actually may have trouble getting into this space uh, located over there. So things to be aware of when we're planning where we're going to put our clips. So now I'm just showing you this because I am, Omran showed a beautiful slide showing what the ASE guidelines recommend with the septal leaflet at the bottom. And this is the RV perspective. And I actually prefer this because I can see the tips much more clearly and the RA perspective with the septum at the bottom. But as you notice, I have been for many of our clip procedures, we do use this um, position where we have the semilunar valves um, or the AV valve at about one o'clock compared to the tricuspid valve. Um, so it can help us identify where we're at the anterior septal leaflet or the posterior septal leaflet. Um, and you'll see both of these views on the next few slides, but that's why we've done that. So we decided that this patient was actually very good for an edge touch repair. And so we went forward with that. And here you can see what's happened with her images. She's now on her back in the in the, op, in the in the cath lab. And you can see once we're starting to put this device in and you can see the shadowing here and our beam is going to be going here and you can see there's ring down effect and shadowing. And so if you don't have a good image before you start, once these devices go in, we get much worse. And so here we're in the right atrium looking down at the tricuspid valve, um, the anterior leaflet is here, septal leaflet, posterior leaflet. And we are going to go first into this area and we can move the tricuspid, uh, the tricuspid device into that anterior septal position. Here we are now diving underneath the valve leaflet this tells us whether where we're at the anterior or posterior, and this is gonna be how we know that the device has grabbed the arms properly. We go from the midesophageal back down into the stomach. We're gonna look at the, the orientation of the clip to make sure that we're perpendicular to co-optation line. And then here we've rotated a little bit so, and we've dropped out the leaflets a little bit just to make sure we can see that clip. And then here we are coming up and you can see the clip closing onto the leaflets there. And this is where once again, it's very challenging with all the shadowing to make sure that you have leaflet in the device and that it's adequate to hold there. Now, this is us after we've um, put that first device in, we do still have some tricuspid regurgitation left. And this is a 3D view, but it's from the our, our V view showing that clip and the residual uh, orifice here with the regurgitation. So we decide to go put a second device in and now we deal with shadowing from the first device as well as putting the second device in. And here we are, we're in the right atrium again, going down. The first device is over here, if you can see it. Here we are into diving into the ventricle. And then here we are trying to close the device in the ventricle. And there we have the two devices next to each other. The coaptation gap is a little bit smaller. And so then we made a decision, do we want to put a third jet in? We go back into the stomach and you can still see that we have a significant jet here. And so we thought we would try a third device. Um, and so here we are going down. But as you can see, our visualization in this plane is actually very tough. We were not certain that we could confirm the device placement. And so we actually about, uh, about, uh, boarded the procedure at this point, given that we had a reduction in the thing, uh, in the, in the, um, MTR. Now, post processing, what do you, or uh, post procedure, what do you want to assess? So, you want to look for residual TR. You want to look at the position of the device and the leaflet attachment. You want to assess for remodeling of the tricuspid valve apparatus if you can, and changes in RV size and function, and looks for signs of reverse remodeling, although that may be more long term. And you want to assess for complications, pericardial fusion, RV strain, new pacemaker lead positioning, and changes in RV stroke volume. Now, you saw in that case, we went up and down into the mesophageal views and then down into transgastrics multiple times. This does cause trauma. So this is a nice study um, looking at an EHR database of over 12,000 TEEs. And the complication rate of um, using ICD codes of bleeding esophageal arthrospiratory tract injury within 20, 72 hours of the procedure was 3.6% in transcatheter trans procedures versus 2.9% in the OR. Um, when you actually look at the different procedures, um, there is a 
huge range in what the rate of uh, complications are. And while there are very low numbers here, I would expect that because if there's a lot of manipulation, that would be higher for some of these devices. And this is a nice study in uh, 50 patients where they actually did uh, endoscopy uh, before and after the TE for the procedure. And almost 86% of the patients had new injury, whether it be minor or complex, and about half of them actually had complex lesions. And the risk factors for complex lesions were longer procedural time and poor suboptimal image qualities because you're struggling a lot more and causing a lot more manipulation of that probe. Now, that being said, there has been some contradictory data from the Mayo Clinic, um, Mayo being different from everyone. And one of the things though is when they did have complications though, they did tend to be in patients who were higher risk, which is something that is what we also see in our experience here. And so this is where there's been a push for intracardiac echo, not in isolation, but it's complementary to transesophageal echocardiogram. This is actually Mayo Clinic data showing their use of TE4 Oh, sorry, ICE and TE for tricuspid valve interventions um, and showing that they have an improvement slightly, even though it's statistically not different um, in, in uh, reducing the TR grade um, for these patients. So in summary, there are um, many devices that have been developed and the most common one, the edge-to-edge repair devices, uh, though uh, tricuspid and application devices are also being used. Um, Transcaster uh, valve replacements are also, but they bring their um, also being used, but they bring their own complications in terms of what you do with pacemaker leads as well as the anticoagulation needs after that. And these bigger trials are needed. The bicable and IVC imp valve implantations devices are sort of um, an end stage treatment to try and improve morbidities at this point. And when you're assessing it, you want to make sure your patient is hemodynamically stable with significant TR. Your assessment is going to be a combination of transesophageal echocardiogram as well as CT if you think you're going towards that device. And if you don't have good transesophageal images, you need to think about using ICE. And once again, you're looking at the location and mechanism as well as size of the gap and leaflets uh, 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 lengths in order to decide what devices you're going to use. Um, thank you for listening. Well, and thank you for uh, presenting, Wendy. That was terrific, just the tour de force of what's going on out there in the world of uh, devices. And I, I really want to say thank you to all of our speakers uh, today. It was a, just a great um, series of talks that kind of bring us forward around this valve that, as Dr. Amran told us 10 years ago, barely showed up in a, in a survey and now uh, has enough interest uh, both in surgery and interventional cardiology and I think for echocardiographers uh, in particular, trying to understand uh, uh, how we can contribute to decision-making um, in those areas. And surprisingly, it's a, you know, it's a young uh, group, uh, uh, area of information. Yehobo, I'm thinking we'll go back to your, uh, to your um, cases just because It'll be interesting. And then really importantly, I think we'll get on to our questions. We have some now. If anybody has any further questions, please put them into the Q&A so we can get to them when we need to. All right, Jehovah. Perfect, thank you, Mike. And thank you to all the speakers. Like uh, that was an, <laughs> an incredible session. I, I really appreciate your help uh, um, to the symposium. And um, we are going to go very quickly because I don't want to keep the people here waiting. We have already abused them in this Saturday, so we will try to actually close it in a fast way. So um, just to, to go back to, okay, let me see. We can find it over here. Okay. Okay, how are you talking? So just to go back to the first uh, two cases that we were presenting, um, after, after actually visualizing, after visualizing the, the lectures that we have, so the big question for the, for the audience is in the first case, and we are going to actually ask you to please uh, participate on the pool now, 
Um, we have a, a case of um, mitral regurgitation that was going for repair. Then we find that there was like a, a moderate uh, anonymous dilatation at 3.8, and then with moderate tricuspid regurgitation. So the question for the audience, if you can pre please answer, we give you like uh, 20 or 30 seconds to do so. What should we do? Should we leave it as it is? Should we try to attempt and repair it in the same surgery? Should we repair it in a deferred surgery? Should we actually go and try to do like a percutaneous intervention in the in the same surgery or afterwards? So you guys can uh, please uh, actually answer the question. Uh, we will get the, the pull from the audience. And the moment that we got the results, uh, we will ask our panelists about uh, their opinion. We've launched the poll and we'll give it another 15 seconds and then we'll close and share the results, okay? Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Fatima. No worries. Okay, so 81% of the people has actually um, say that uh, we should repair it and in the same surgery. What do the experts think about that? Uh, well, maybe I'll go, I'll go first, uh, uh, Jacob. Um, well, we're in the operating room. We've just finished operating on the mitral valve. Uh, the MR is there. It's, uh, if I understood the, the presentation correct, it was um, looked like there was some prolapse of the posterior leaflet uh, as opposed to tethering. And that's pretty easy to fix. You know, you, you can do an Alfieri type stitch, uh, which is similar to what the tri-clip was doing where you, you're attaching a prolapsing leaflet to a, an adjacent leaflet that's not prolapsing. Or we could even do, um, you know, a bicuspidization where we sort of exclude the annulus that the posture leaflet sits in and, and just end up with a, a two leaflet tricuspid valve with, a, with an appropriately sized annuloplasty. And I think that'd be highly durable and, and highly successful and offers really minimal incremental risk to the patient. It certainly adds a bit of surgical time, but um, none of the data that I've seen in adding tricuspid valve interventions during mitral valve surgery uh, results in any sort of excessive or increased operative uh, uh, mortality risk. So I, I, I support the, the audience's decision on that. But you know, it is important, it is reasonable as you know, Dr. Tang's talk was fantastic. And you know, this the option number E is becoming more and more of a reality. Um, and it's almost similar to what we're experiencing in aortic valve surgery when we do bypass surgery with moderate aortic stenosis. You know, we say, well, we'll leave it and we'll do a TAVI in five years or 10 years. So um, it, it is changing the landscape. We'll be interested to see where that, how that all uh, plays out. Wendy, what, what do you think? I, I think so. But I mean, I, in this era, I mean, I agree with you. I would probably fix it at the time of surgery because I think it's a simple fix. And the other thing is that as um, as good as we are at reducing it, we don't get as good of a surgical result as you would because you would not leave moderate. We, we have the scale of torrential massive to, to down to severe to, and somewhat to make us feel better <laughs> on the imaging side. But, but in, in all seriousness, uh, you would not leave moderate in the OR you would get rid of that. And that has to play a role in long-term outcomes on, on these patients. And in some of these younger patients, I don't know if it's appropriate to, to, to just leave that and wait till they have problems down there. Now, I think a, um, a lifelong approach to the valve interventions is something that we're probably heading towards, but, um, and it depends on what technology it is because uh, the, the uh, edge to edge repair techniques may actually not um, be the ones to go forward. Yeah, I just read an article talking about how in the in the interventional world we're going from repair to replacement, whereas in the surgical world we, we went from replacement to repair. So it's like coming full circle almost. But but we're still in the development phase, and you know we're we're another five or ten years from now could be drastically different than what the technologies we have today. Right. So uh, yeah, 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 but yeah. anyway, I want to say, I want to support this uh, two idea, Dr. Latter and uh, Wendy. This is probably even more than moderate because you had the flow reversal in the hepatic vein and you had the effective orifice area of 0.4 centimeters squared. So in some criteria, it was more than moderate. 
So we are very happy. If it's more than moderate, our already guidelines says we should do it. Even we don't need to measure the tricuspid annular dimension. So that that should be done in the same session in the OR. And uh, as Dr. Latter was saying, adding tricuspid valve repair in the OR really does not add anything to the mortality of the patient in that surgery. Perfect, Matt. We will try to fix your video. We will contact Fatima and see if we can actually get the, this video for Dr. Ambran, please, fixed. And then exactly that, that's actually what we did in, in that case. And then before we go to the core, uh, hey, Jacob, the what was the, what was the repair? Was I was it just a simple annuloplasty, or was there some leaflet work? An annuloplasty. Yeah, yeah, but the, he probably the surgeon probably sort of placated out the area of the prolapsing PL, so that it sort of almost no longer contributes to the uh, to the Correct, right, because the the, the the coaptation gap was from the posterior leaflet. That's the one that wasn't. Yeah. So similar, similar to what I sort of showed in that stunt man, where that area between the septum and the posterior leaflet can really be quite large. And there's just no way the leaflets can co-opt there. But you placate them out with the annuloplasty, you can take care of that. Yeah. So before we go to the rest of the Q&A, like uh, we have a second question for the audience and it's regarding, uh, that, that's a little bit more difficult. Like uh, that will be regarding the, the second case that we did. So as I remember, as a, a summary, it was like a liver transplant patient where we find like uh, preoperatively have like uh, just non-significant ER. And then when we went intra -op, we we did find the uh, we did find the uh, actually severe TR, uh, but under those conditions, no. When you go for a liver transplant, you have volume overload, you have some cirrhosis cardiomyopathy. So the the difficult question that we find that day, and I was called uh, there to actually give my opinion on the on the TE and the cardiac surgeon was actually called in the room to actually give the opinion. It's what should we do? Should we leave it as it is? Should we try to repair it? Uh, should we do it uh, in the same surgery of the liver transplant, or should we actually try later on, or or in the same surgery to to do a, a percutaneous procedure? So we will leave some uh, some seconds for the people to answer, and when we go the answer, we will go at it. I'll give it another 10 seconds and then I'll show the results, Jacobo. Perfect. Thank you very much, Fatima. No problem. It's, it's interesting because I, I remember the time that we're doing the, the, liver, the liver transplantation, we have probably like uh, six different people coming from the cardiac department <laughs> to actually see what, uh, what was going to be the final decision. <laughs> so this is one of those things. Okay, so 45% of the people just uh, leave it as it is, like 32, like probably a tri clip. Why do the experts think? When did you want to go first? Because I'm no expert. <laughs> I am. I mean, I think this is complicated. I, I, I personally probably would have left it and seen what happens after the surgery because there's a lot of fluid shift. They're not hemodynamically optimized. And, and you've got to kind of believe what you saw on a baseline transthoracic that there wasn't there. So what else could there be in, in the hemodynamics? Liver surgery is a big surgery and there's a lot of fluid shifts there. So I would be patient and see if it actually gets better um, and let them recover from the liver surgery and then make a decision. Now, I may regret that once they develop their AFib and they're calling me in the morning to manage it, but um, I think it's sort of what, uh, what I would kind of tend to do. I would be conservative in this stage and get them through the transplant. Yeah. Ahmed, do you have a comment? Uh, no, I totally agree with Wendy because that guideline for um, TR, the degree of the TR is based on the transthoracic guideline, transthoracic study. It means we, we look at the study of the patient before or outside. We, our decision is mainly in the secondary TR based on the transthoracic echo that was done before the war. So before or this patient had only mild TR. Now, uh, as was said, we have a massive fluid shift. So this severe TR is mainly because of the fluid and we should do nothing in this session, yeah. 
We have, yeah, we I, I, I agree. To, to add a cardiac procedure onto a person who's just undergone a liver transplant, I think that would be re really risky. Um, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure Annette, who would be sort of one of these people. Well, who... I mean, I would make a couple of comments. One, you know, we have a very large liver transplant program here. Um, the evaluations of our patients can be up to a year before they present for liver transplants. So it may well be that you can have changes in the amount of uh, cardiac performance before they uh, have their liver transplant. Um, we get by this by actually not echoing our patients. So unless there's a hemodynamic event interoperatively, we do not routinely, in Yokobonosis, uh, routinely echo our liver transplants here. Um, so I think those two things would mean that we probably would be flying blind um, and just approach the patient as a normal liver transplant. Yeah, so, no, I, I agree completely. And uh, I'm hopeful that, you know, it, it just shows you how, how, how fluid, you know, balance can really inf in, influence the, the severity of TR. So mm -hmm. hopefully this would get better post-op with uh, appropriate, uh, you know, therapy. And if it didn't, I think, you know, these future, and um, um, you know, transcutaneous options are becoming a reality and, and could well be affected. And, you know, if you needed primary, if you needed cardiac surgery a year later or six months later, well, that would be unfortunate, but that's not impossible too. But to add it at the time of a liver transplant, I think is excessively risky. Now. So I would I would have left it alone. So that, that was actually the, the common decision between everyone. Like we decided to, uh, to leave the tricuspid as it was. And then after the transplant uh, and when the patient recovered, he came in for a follow-up echo and he was only diagnosed with mild TR. And then we leave it alone. So just to finish, I'm going to actually stop uh, to sharing the screen. And then, um, Mike, if you want, we are open for the questions from the from the from, from the audience, please. You hope I'm uh, I'm cognizant of the fact that it's uh, now four o'clock. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask uh, one question, um, and then uh, and then I think we're going to have to wrap it up. All right. Yep. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, the, through, for no other reason than he, he was the first from Dr. Shim, uh, would, uh, this is a question for Dr. Ladder. Would you perform tricuspid annuloplasty in patients with a TV annular diameter greater than four centimeters, but only a mild degree of TR upon left-sided valve surgery? Well, that's a good question. And in fact, that's, that's basically what was done in the Mount Sinai paper uh, from David Adams. They, they, they did, everyone who had elite, who had moderate, TR or worse were operated on, and or if they had an annulus greater than four four centimeters, they were operated on, and so that's how they got to a rate of sixty five percent of mitral valve patients were having a tricuspid valve procedure, yeah. uh, and they showed less TR, uh, less right sided heart failure, you know, three four five years down the road, but the same survival. Um, the group out of um, you know, the original paper from England that talked about the seven centimeters was a similar concept. The seven centimeters in the linear diameter is roughly four centimeters in right. a circular diameter. And they operated on those patients as well and had good outcomes. So I think, yes, I mean, an annulus that's dilated, it's, it, is, it is, has a ri significant risk of getting more dilated and developing significant TR, even if it's only mild at the, at the current time. So yeah, I, I think... I've modified, uh, and I may modify my approach a little bit more after this talk, but I'm going to be a bit more aggressive on dilated annuluses. And four centimeters is 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 bigger than normal for sure by a significant amount. I really I really like the concept that Wendy introduced as well as a, a, you know the lifetime evaluation of that valve. Yeah. Um, you know the just just the sense of where the patient is in terms of what, what what's going to happen. I think that's an important part of the decision making in there as well. Great. Wendy, so what's the normal annulus dimension in, in a, it's like 30, 30 millimeters, 28. So, so 40 is like, it's, it's enormous, really. You're talking yourself into operating. Well, I think a little bit depends on where you're measuring things, obviously, but um, I, I would like to ask Dr. Ladder, um, you know, if you have, you know, moderate TR and you have unfavorable repair options. So in other words, you have, you know, leaflet tethering, mm -hmm. uh, your leaflet tethering area is um, high. Um, yeah. What would you do in that situation? 
Well, you know, that's a great question, Ed, because we've been, we've, down, we've been down that road with mitral valve. And we know when you have significant tethering in mitral valve, when we put an annuloplasty ring on, it looks better in UR and often looks better by the time they go home. But within a year or so, it starts to come back because it's not just the annulus, it's also the tethering. So that's why um, Robert Dion has suggested that you ought to be doing a leaflet extension with a, a bit of a, a pericardial patch. I haven't done a lot of that, to be honest with you, but I think it's probably a good idea um, uh, because it, that's the only way we can uh, address tethering by giving a longer leaflet so we have more ability to co-opt. Uh, so I think if you're going to do, if you're going to intervene with, with significant tethering, you've got to put the ring on and try and do something to give you more surface area of anterior leaflet. So I think, it, you know, just to emphasize the point here, um, you know, it's not just all about annular measurements. I think as echocardiographers, we really do have to look closely at where that coaptation point is and help our surgeons uh, by telling them information that potentially they may not want to hear because I think they're all set on just putting that annuloplasty ring in. But obviously, I think it behooves us to, to just at least provide that information and they can determine what they want to do with that information. But yeah. thank you, everybody. Great panel. Yeah. I think that's an excellent co comment, and that uh, you know we really do rely you uh, give us eyes on the functioning tricuspid valve because when we see it, it's just a floppy thing, and we don't really know the the geometric uh, sizes of a working right ventricle. You know, I wish we had more time. I got to be honest with you, because this I've got a whole list of questions here. Anyway, I, I once again I want to thank all of our speakers for their generosity uh, in sharing their knowledge with us this afternoon, especially on a Saturday afternoon in, in uh, September. In particular, I wanna highlight the work done by Dr. Moreno in curating this session, um, both in conceiving the topic and then arranging the speakers. I hope I'll leave the last words for you. No, I just really wanted to thank the speakers, like um, their generosity to actually join the symposium. And, uh, and I think they, they were really helpful um, at least if, if I wanted to actually go, uh, do a good review in tricuspid regurgitation and cardiac surgery, definitely I would put it that way, no? First analyzing how we analyze the TR, then going for a functional TR and clarifying the differences, go to the surgical decision, and then the cardiologist's point of view with the percutaneous intervention. I think it was great. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks. Okay, and I think that will wrap us up for today. Um, we're gonna be starting back tomorrow at uh, 8.45, is that right? And, uh, and, then, uh, and so we'll look forward to seeing you all there tomorrow. Uh, again, thanks to all of you who've stuck with us right through to the end. Um, it's really been very enjoyable, thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye.